Okay, hello everyone. Right now I will present to you the Fireware Use Cases panel directed and moderated by Juan Joyero. Please give, them a, give, please give them a warm welcome. Yeah, great. Thank you very much. Uh, well, I guess that um, this is the second day, right, of, the, of this campus party. Uh, and uh, you have uh, starting to hear a lot of about Fireware, the FIPPP, this ambitious program that are, we are running with very nice prize in hackathons and providing technology uh, that you as developers can use for develop nice applications in the feeder internet. Uh, this session is about is elaborating on, on, on some examples and testimonies of how Fireware could be used in different usage areas and in particular with particular interest and focus on smart cities. For those who uh, have not uh, had the opportunity to, to, to see us in the main stage uh, presentation of the uh, Fireware and the FIPPP, let me show you a small video uh, that could introduce the whole program and the project. The Internet today provides citizens communication, information delivery, social networks, mobile applications, media contents, and e-commerce. It is a great achievement for humankind. However, its sustainability is tied so far to limited business revenues, mainly digital and physical assets trading, e-commerce, leisure, media contents, and advertising, user profiling, online adverts. New businesses and growth should emerge. Otherwise, the so-called Internet economy bubble will certainly become true and therefore collapse. Sectors like energy, agriculture, logistics of things and people, environmental care, media contents and urban development and safety are suitable to exploit totally new frameworks of Internet services. Such a synergic combination will lead to the creation of new opportunities, revenues and jobs on both sides, the ICT sector and each one of those industries. To enable this path, the European Commission and leading companies in Europe have implemented the Future Internet Public-Private Partnership, PHI-PPP. Fiware is building the core platform, a kind of operating system of the future Internet, by focusing on the technology. Work is focused on technology alternative selection, alignment and influence in standards adopted by the industry, and the complexity of scalability and performance. On the contrary, use case projects focus today on requirements of actual customers within vertical sectors. Later on, they will work out high solutions based on the Fireware platform. With all that in mind, What's really new in this platform that will disrupt the current landscape for the sake of vertical sectors? One of the main challenges of Fireware as a project, besides delivering an architecture and real-life implementation of a software architecture, is to enable an open community of developers to move all outcomes forward. Fireware enablers are classified in wide technology chapters, Good, so as you see, a very ambitious program is uh, implying an investment, overall investment of 600 million euros uh, coming together from a public-private partnership and bringing together the major stakeholders in the ICT industry in Europe, but also the European Commission and trying to not only deliver the technology, but very importantly, create an open innovation ecosystem that is, helping, uh, is able to attract 
the major stakeholders, the developers, the application sponsors, the technology providers, and anything that uh, is needed to really boost the economy in Europe and lower the barriers of innovations uh, for startups and developers. This technology can be used in a wide range of uh, application domains. And here we are bringing some testimonies about how this could be used. Let me show you a video on how this could be used in one of those domains. Today's energy providers have really embraced change. There are huge transformations happening in the energy sector. Everywhere you see wind generation and solar panel on roofs, and this is causing problems and challenges to the energy grid operators. At the same time, consumers want to be able to optimize the efficiency of their energy usage, and many consumers want to become prosumers. Making the grid bi-directional requires us to bring in new technologies from the communications and information technology sector. Well, the energy world is changing drastically in the upcoming decades. Consumers will become producers and producers will have a total different influence on their consumption. And in the midst of it is the grid. It is vitally important to make that smart, intelligent and applicable. There's a lot more distributed generation at this stage. So we have solar, wind power, biomass, all different sources of electricity. They're all on the grid. From a technology viewpoint, the main challenge is, is how we link uh, renewable power sources into the electrical grid. And in order to accomplish that, we need better infrastructure. ICT is the function which will look at how we answer the different problems that exist here. In order to achieve a high efficiency, we need, of course, communication, information technology to automate the interlinking of both systems. Things are changing rapidly and the merge between energy and ICT is an incredible revolution and that's what we work on here in ACS. In the FINESC project, we have the opportunity to build real working trials of the concepts and solutions that were developed in the FINCINI project to balance the energy demand and generation in the smart grid. The results of these trials will pave the way towards implementing a smart grid in Europe. Great. So this was uh, just a brief uh, introduction about the program and one of the areas more promising were um, fiber technologies and the creation of this open innovation ecosystem uh, is really promising. But there is uh, a second area about which uh, we have set up this round table which is smart cities and for this we have we are glad to, to, to present and introduce to you uh, this uh, uh, panel, exciting panel of representatives from different cities in Europe. So let me introduce briefly each of them. Um, Ms. Katia Beatrici uh, comes from the municipality of Trento and from 2007 she is in charge of the international relationship by the cabinet of the mayor and also representing Trento in many of uh, uh, international initiatives and involved in the programs towards the uh, push of uh, smart cities uh, policies. Mr. Ger Baron represents the Amsterdam Economic Board, whose mission is to facilitate knowledge institutions, companies and the government to collaborate in the field of innovation. 
making usage of the technology and quite involved in all open data initiatives and smart city initiatives in linked to the city of Aston. And Mr. Dave Carter, and DDA coordinates the Manchester Digital Strategy and is part of the Red Generation Division of the Manchester City Council. He coordinates the Manchester Living Lab and quite involved in well reputed uh, uh, representatives of uh, the smart city initiatives from the city of Manchester. And uh, finally, Mr. Mark Sanderson is the first director of Malaga Bali international economic development. He's uh, involved in many activities there that have, to, that have to do with fostering entrepreneurship in the city of Malaga and also dealing with the uh, internationalization aspects in the city and uh, several smart cities initiatives in that city. With this first introduction, uh, I would like to make uh, open the floor with a very open question. We all heard about this buzzword about the smart cities, open data, and all the stuff is in all newspapers and so on. But what is your particular vision about the smart city concept and how are you trying to materialize that vision through the different programs in in your city? Maybe Dave Carter, could you take first your... Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm really here to think of two things. One is my own city, Manchester. I don't know how many people know it in the north of England. A failing industrial city facing absolute economic disaster at the late 80s, which has had to reinvent itself. And I think to us, a smart city actually is infrastructure's fine, but it's about people. I can't see how you can possibly have a smart city or a community without smart people. So our focus is on how you engage users, how you build digital literacy, how you get people involved in generating services and content through co-production. The second view is because we have this connected smart cities network, which I chair, I found myself on the board, the advisory board of the Future Internet PPP. And I'm the only person there who represents you guys, i.e. users. So one of the things I want to get out of this is if you've got a view of FIWARE or FIPPP, how it can be improved, please let me know, because at the moment, empirical feedback about what's fantastic and what's not is not that yet. So I'm really looking forward to get that from the Q&A session today. Gerd, uh, your uh, economic, uh, the Standard Economic Board also involves uh, entrepreneurs and technology providers. How are you trying to put all this mix together in, in your uh, strategy and, and towards the definition of a smart citizen? Well, actually, I think, uh, uh, having a great question, I mean, the, the challenge is how to make people collaborate because in the end, like they've stated, it is about people. I think when, when we start to work at our smart city uh, program in 2008, 2009, uh, we were a bit influenced by all the big corporates who came with this 150 pages slide decks with uh, having about smart cities or connected city or intelligent cities and they all stated they were a solution for everything. Uh, there's a technology to solve every problem and then we thought well maybe this is not the way, maybe it's not like our mayor presses a button and he just orders a smart city and then he get this control center and all these buttons to turn on and everything. But th this is not a smart city we envision. So, we thought, well, when you talk about, it's, it's about like every city, it's an interaction between entrepreneurs, citizens, consumers, uh, the government in a role, uh, facilitating all these things, knowledge institutions to come up with new concepts and bring knowledge. And one of the ways we've been starting to do that uh, up to 2009 is first have an infrastructure program, making sure the infrastructures are in place, means broadband, internet, uh, LTE, fiber to the home, smart energy grids and all these things, which is important to have in your, in, your, in your city as a base. But on top of that, people should come up with applications that make use of the city, uh, make use of these infrastructures, come up with ideas for energy, for healthcare and so on. And the way to do that for us was basically, to, well, like, like uh, Manchester is doing, is find this living lab model where we just started to, well, lean startup methodology uh, 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 basically just to try things and see what worked and what didn't work. And for us, this was the best way to involve uh, SMEs, especially into this smart city thinking, because real innovation doesn't come from the corporates. Once it is there, they can implement it and scale it and all these things. But by, by us, it was really by doing, doing loads of pilots, experiments, 
before we went to scaling when you talk about smart cities and and now all those things interact with consumers inter interact with uh, entrepreneurs who just are in the city so well living lab methodology was pretty important for us i think and our current philosophy is that well we basically see the city as an infrastructure platform where we invite entrepreneurs large small to come up with their solutions applications for our smart city to improve well life of the people working and living in a city. Indeed are uh, introducing this concept of ecosystem with, with yeah. the several stakeholders. So one question that I would like to make uh, to all of you and uh, starting with Ms. Beatrice is how could you achieve the critical mass because that is uh, an important aspect. Is, is this something you believe a city can make alone or, or how do you envision this could be materialized in, in your study in Trento. Yeah, thank you. Not, no, uh, alone, I think that uh, we have uh, no possibility, no chance uh, to have success in our process in order to be a smart city. Uh, in order to have a critical mass, uh, we have uh, to join and to collaborate with the public uh, and private sector. Um, the partnership is a crucial point uh, of our success. Uh, and uh, in order to be critical, we have to attract uh, developers uh, and uh, SM SME and uh, funding also. And uh, we are trying uh, to do it. Uh, we, we signed an important uh, partnership with our university and the research center uh, working in our region. But uh, in order to mention uh, your question, not alone is not possible to have SAS. Uh, we have to, to join, uh, to share, um, to share a, a language, a common uh, environment uh, where uh, everybody is able to think smart. What about Mark? Uh, the, the the policies in Malaga and the play in the, the the role that the Malaga Valley is playing in that thing. Well, for, first of all, thank you for for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in the in this forum, this roundtable. Um, I'm excited to be here from from Malaga. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Malaga is on the southern uh, coast of of Spain. It is the birthplace of, of Pablo Picasso. Uh, like Manchester, we're, we're, we've suffered our uh, economic trials as well. I think you've probably read about in the press as far as what Spain is, is going through right now with its uh, unemployment. When we look at, at, at a smart city and how to, to utilize that for, for us, um, what, we, what we see is that it's important for not only to have the people involved, but also to use the technologies that are available in order to provide better services uh, using you know, less money, less energy uh, for, for the citizens. I mean, ultimately what we want to try to do is create a city uh, that, that functions uh, and ultimately saves time for, for the citizens, right? Because everyone uh, is running around with their work, with their life, uh, education, et cetera, and, the, and what they're really looking for is, is ways they can save time. And they don't want to be stuck in traffic. Uh, they don't want to have to be waiting for or have problems with electricity or waiting for the bus to come and all these other things. So any way that we can use uh, technology in order to help uh, our citizens have a better experience, uh, not only our citizens but the people that are visiting our city, uh, is, is extremely important to us. The city of Malaga is, is, is committed to that. Uh, the mayor is, has been focusing on that for the last um, eight to ten years. Uh, a lot of that has been that we the, the programs that we've implemented have been thankful for a project that is Malaga Valley, which you mentioned, which is uh, as a, a park, a technology park of 500 companies, technology companies that we have there, uh, both multinationals and SMEs. And what we're doing is is this ecosystem that you mentioned is is helping them uh, have access to this the the data and the services that the city has, and asking them. What, what can we do to, to help the citizens? What sort of solutions can we provide? Um, and it's amazing what, they, what those uh, entrepreneurs can come up with, things that we've never thought of before. So that's, that's really, uh, and in the end, we all win, and we create a, you know, a smarter city that, that functions, reduces you know, a, a, the CO2 emissions, using renewable energy, et cetera. So that's, that's what we're, we're looking for and, and where we're driving in, in Malaga. Yeah, a lot of about open innovation, open data. What can you tell us, Dave? And then in Manchester, what are you uh, approaching that that uh, that is? Uh, the most important thing for us is to encourage kind of autonomous action uh, by um, developers and activists. We have a very active open data Manchester group. 
which has nothing to do with the City Council. It's organised by people who want to see change, whether they are developers themselves or whether they're, they're active in campaigning for open data. Uh, and, and they really challenge us as a city, firstly, to be open data by default, which we've just declared. So in future, all staff of the city have to make a case for why data is closed. Otherwise, it's open automatically. Uh, we had our first major hackathon uh, last year where 16 new apps were developed and we're actually working to support four of those groups, develop those apps as apps that will be used for the cities, free to citizens, but then could be licensed for them to commercially exploit as entrepreneurs. But, and the key thing is we have one creative space which has also been set up uh, autonomously called the Manchester Digital Lab. Everyone calls it Mad Lab because it is a bit mad in what it does, but it's a fantastic catalyst for new ideas. And if you want to know more about what's happening at Manchester at the Creative Edge, just look at Mad Lab for doing that. And that has really encouraged people in authority to understand that developers aren't just a pain who keep asking you to do things in the city that you don't really want to do. They can actually be really creative partners and out of that can come new jobs, new skills, new applications. And that boosts both the reputation of the city and the economy of the city and that's got to be a good thing. So our focus really is, uh, as uh, Gare said, on the Living Lab approach, which is getting test projects, pilot projects. We have a do-it-yourself Arduino sensor project monitoring, air quality, we have further hackathons planned, but you've you really just got to engage with the users and make things happen. Thank you. Now I would like to make a, an open question to the, the whole panel and, and please, uh, you know, take your time and uh, take the turn and, and, and then speak whenever you want and even um, uh, amend, uh, comment on, on whatever comment from the other speaker. The open question to the round table is what is the role you envision that the standards uh, may play and the definition of a platform may play in this concept of materialization, uh, materialization of a smart city? And what can be done in, uh, regarding the, the definition of this open innovation ecosystem that we aim to boost? And what is the role of Fireware and the FIPPP in this whole constant? What, uh, could we help you in this approach and so on? So, anyone who wants to answer Th this question? Thank you for such an easy question. Um, I'd I, I just make I one, yes. one, one, <laughs> one comment to start, really. Uh, one is that no one really knows yet. Standards in the past have been defined by governments and big corporations. Can we have open standards in the same way that we think about open data and open source, i.e. de facto standards that are agreed by communities and then they are demonstrated that that's a really good way to ensure interoperability and people working together? And I think some of the work around things like Arduino technology, Internet of Things, can begin to establish those kind of standards. But this is really why we need your feedback on Fireware, because we think it can work, we think it should work, but we're not yet sure or whether it will work or how effectively it will be. And that's where engaging users to actually have some element, not just a feedback, but of actually control and decision making in the way we develop those platforms is so important. Uh, yeah, for the, sa the same, uh, what I told, I mentioned it before, in order to uh, have a common culture and a common environment, uh, we have uh, to, act, uh, to act together and uh, to work on common standards. And it's like uh, we have a kitchen course and everybody go to the supermarkets, buy by himself uh, the salt, the pepper, vinaigrette and oil. So we are, uh, we are trying in Trentino, in Trento, to fill the refrigerator with everything uh, a chef uh, made, uh, the cooker can uh, need in order to dress the table. So uh, common instruments, uh, uh, big bases, very rich, uh, and uh, everybody can uh, use uh, the resource uh, in order to create a trick, uh, create innovation. Well, I, th I think, um, well, on, on my left hand, I just heard a e good economic crisis was very good for Manchester and, and Malaga. <laughs> well, we really never had a real crisis in Amsterdam, so maybe we should ha have one as well. Uh, for the last 400 years, actually, we've been very rich as a city, and uh, our rich started 
because we were opening up financial data, basically. Uh, 400 years ago, Amsterdam was the richest city in the world. Over 50% of all the uh, cargo vessels in the world were registered in Amsterdam. Um, because you had a small square in the middle of the city of 4 by 400 meters, where basically all the information of cargo in the world was available and accessible. We know exactly what, what ship in the world was, who owned the cargo, what cargo was on it, where it was from, where it was going to, type of vessel, and so on. So that enabled us to start the first stock exchange, first financial newspapers, and so on. And that enabled average citizens of Amsterdam to invest in cargo, be part of the trade, and so on and so on. So actually 400 years ago, open data made us the richest city in the world, basically, when you think about it. When you translate that, at that moment, it was very important to have certain standards about, uh, well, how do you uh, uh, have the typology of the ships, how do you have the indications for types of cargo, and so on, otherwise you couldn't compare what you were doing. I think we now see the same thing. I mean, we've been organizing hackathons and apps competitions for the last five years on a, well, uh, annual base, biannual base sometimes, to three, four times a year when you we, we look into it. There are over 100 apps be developed at the moment based on open data and so on. But we all see the business models of these open data apps are not for the city of Amsterdam. Business models are only will, will be working when you could use the same apps in different cities throughout Europe or throughout the world in the end. So I think standardization is very important and I think when fireware can be the layer in between organizing the discussion, what standards, what protocols we need to use in a city, it will be a tremendous added value because then you really can start to make scale and compare the information of other cities in the world and make sure apps don't only work in our, well, insignificant city, I would almost say, because we're only one million people, uh, but use it throughout Europe. So then you really can start make the revolution Dave was talking about and get this bottom-up approach and you can make applications that are replicable throughout Europe. So I think fireware, and I'm, I'm not sure if this will be the standard in the end, but we'll, what it does right now is organize the discussions, organize the community to come up with the proper protocols and proper standards in the near future, hopefully. And I think this is something we as a city really need because, well, we still have a city board who thinks in regulations and they're all lawyers and everything, but technology and data within the city will be the biggest driver of well, prosperity within the next years and well, we need standards and platforms to make it happen. Yeah, and I would add that it's not, no, nothing that only the city needs but also the developers because uh, it, and the, the great opportunity there is also that uh, whatever you develop for one city could be uh, exactly. offered to all the cities in Europe and why not if we make it a very successful world to other regions and open opportunities to SMEs and entrepreneurs in, uh, in Europe to, to go and expand globally because internet is about globalization. What do you think? I, I agree. One note that when I said the city, I, I didn't mean the government. I, when I talk about the city, it's about people living there, working there and so on. So the city is inclusive and not the city government. To, to so what is really, what do you think about the opportunity this could bring to the developers, the startups? Uh, you have a very close uh, connection to those yeah. uh, through Malaga Valley. So how do I you see this? No, I think it's um, the standardization is is, is important. Uh, all all of these smart cities you see represented today, uh, we have you know uh, sensors measuring uh, air quality, water flow, uh, even noise pollution. Uh, all the buses are being tracked. We're collecting all this information and, and data, and, and the question now is how to use it. What is it going to be? How are we going to use that to improve our citizens' lives? And we also need to be able to to compare that to to other cities in order to to. I guess scalability to use it. So as, as these entrepreneurs get involved, uh, if they just make a solution application for Malaga, uh, for example, and it's not scalable because there are no standards involved, uh, then I think it, it fails, right? And, and also, that's not to say that the solution for Malaga can't be created by, by some entrepreneur in, in Amsterdam, for example, but if, if they're not using the same, you're not comparing apples to apples, then you're not, it's not going to work. So the standardization uh, and the programs behind Fireware are, are critical for that, so that we can we can. I mean, the internet connects everyone together, but we need to make sure the data is is on the same same page as well. And and that's I think where the platform for Fireware provides that connectivity. And you have to have the standards involved, so that you can have you can make the comparisons, but also the solutions are then you know scalable around around the world, around Europe. So, Dave, you mentioned earlier then the uh, standards could not be 
created by organizations as from the scratch in theory, from a theoretical perspective or theoretical approach. We believe uh, really in fiber about driven by implementation standards. So is that the way you envision that these standards in smart city field will emerge? Uh, I, I just hope so. Uh, I mean, the, the problem in the past is when you have mentioned standards to startup companies, users, you know, it's not something that they feel any ownership of. Standards are obviously set down. I mean, if you're a small company dealing in manufacturing with certain ISO standards, you see this as regulation. You see this as a burden, uh, often not necessarily an opportunity or something positive. So I think the real challenge is to find, out, find ways that in this world of future, future internet, of, of cloud, of internet of things, of open data, standards can be built from the bottom up as well as the top down and that means compromises may have to be reached. So those that own certain patents may have to sacrifice some of those in this kind of Wikinomics world to be willing to let that out to people um, into the almost open source world. But equally, people who are developing open source products have to realize that things like interoperability are a very, very serious issue. And you can't just have 16 different versions of an open source app, none of which really works together. Yeah. So if we can reach a compromise, we could potentially get the best of both worlds. But I think there's still got to be much more engagement with the user community, because at the moment, I still fear that so, many stand so much standards work is developed in isolation. And users are asked um, only when the standard is nearly developed and users are not involved in that earlier stage of design work. And so when in the Living Labs movement, we talk about user-driven open innovation from the very, very first stage of specification and, and validation. Many times when we talk about smart cities, I have uh, find out that many people thought about individuals and how this could uh, affect the, the life of citizens uh, in as in an individual basis. But I believe it has a lot of potential also about how businesses uh, are performed in the city and how uh, they can really uh, achieve the higher productivity and run their business more efficiently. What, what do you think about this, girl or Mark? Well, absolutely. I mean, the, the whole, I, I mean, well, to, to Say, well, I don't know a better comparison, so I use a very old one. But I mean, the whole idea that d data is the, the fuel of 2013, basically, so fossil fuel will be replaced by data in terms of business models. I mean, this is happening. And what, what, what happens in, in when you talk about smart cities, which basically is a marketing concept created by IBM, and we use it because it's great to tell the story when you think about that, these things. But in the end, it's about how to cope and use the information that's available nowadays with the millions of sensors you have around and how to get this information to people who can make automated or personal decisions or what they're going to do and, th and this will be part of the business model of m many many companies I mean um, think about how we uh, pick our books nowadays I mean when you log in on Amazon you get 25 tips of the books your best friends read I mean this will also be the way how to find your way throughout the city or uh, how to go to your retail store or do your groceries and so on so the streams of data that go throughout the city will be well very interesting to to cope with that in terms of IT infrastructure, data centers, and everything. But to leverage on that, I mean, it, this will be the new business models uh, uh, very soon. I mean, when you look at well, last 10, 15 IPOs in the United States, uh, 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 um, most of them are about resources and, and, and materials, or about companies who earn their money with data. So data will be the the key, new key business model, I'm pretty sure about it. One question to Ms. Uh, Beatrice is, um, Trento is a good example where we talk about the region of Trento, but also the city of Trento, municipality. How you envision that uh, uh, policies can be shared among both municipality level, region level, and efforts can be uh, put uh, together in towards yeah. materialization so all these concepts and usage of open data because open data is not just municipality data is there also data about regions and how that can be combined for the benefit of businesses and citizens we are already working a lot uh, in order uh, to 
to collaborate. Uh, we collaborate uh, and we have um, uh, many agreements uh, I mentioned before uh, among university, the research center, region, provincial level and uh, municipal level. And uh, then our uh, next uh, challenge will be the education. We have uh, to educate not only citizens, uh, but also our administrator and our mayor and our, uh, our executive of the, all the political level. We have to educate them to, to create uh, this, uh, not, uh, not uh, to offer open data, because we offer uh, a lot of open data. Uh, it is uh, a, a part of our project, uh, but uh, to create an open system. Because if you create an open system, uh, this uh, 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 common language, that uh, allows uh, to, to, to speak it each other better and to create more innovation. So this is our uh, next, uh, next step, uh, the 3.0 <laughs> mission of our region to collaborate and to educate citizens and politicians also. Uh, do you want to, to say something, uh, Mark? Well, I think it, it's important to not just look at the cities, but also look at the surrounding areas. And, and, and that's one thing we do in, in the region of Malaga Valley. I mean, that's, it includes not only the city of Malaga, but the surrounding cities as well. Um, and the, you, some, of the, some of the other areas around Malaga offer different things, whether it's uh, you know, financial uh, backing or investments, uh, and the city provides the logistics and the organization, uh, and the people may come and live from another area. So I think uh, it's important to aggregate, not be limited just to, to the city, but to look at all the resources around the city in order to, to build on that. Again, we don't know where or who's going to come up with the next solution, and we want to uh, open this data up and, and have them have access to it to, to find the solutions. Well, I have a lot of questions, but I would like uh, to leave the floor also to people in the audience to make uh, some questions to, to the panelists. Uh, so if uh, there is any question, uh, if not, I can continue, but please uh, raise your hand and make uh, any question. Don't be shy. It's not that often you can speak to Dave. <laughs> <laughs> It's uh, interesting to hear uh, of your thoughts on how smart cities, uh, smart cities are coming about and how you're integrating uh, into that. My, my question is actually a bit more specific. Have you got any examples of how uh, service sector companies like maybe waste disposal companies or electric companies are already integrating uh, data to either improve their business models or improve the lives of citizens? Yeah, 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 yeah well, yeah. Um, well, on all teams, basically, but energy probably is the most, well, classic one, basically. I mean, when you look at how our program evolved, when we started in 2009, the starting point of everything we did, give insight to people. So give people insight in the use of energy, waste, mobility, and so on. So let's take the energy example, healthcare. Take the energy example. Um, we started out with giving, uh, developing energy displays, giving energy feedback from the smart meter, who were far away in the closet most of the time, uh, to apps on their mobile phone to give insights. Uh, and once we started to do that, so immediately there was a whole bunch of companies who came up with all types of services that related to the use of energy based on consumer behavior and stimulate people to behave differently. And now you see that there are, uh, I think, well, we spend two billion a year in, in, in a metropolitan area of Amsterdam to buy, procure energy. And nowadays, 100 million of the same 2 billion, because same, still the same amount of money, is being spent on services that relate saving energy. And awareness is created because people see the effects directly. And loads of business models are now based on, uh, what, like you procure solar panels, you can immediately measure if the solar panel delivered the amount of energy that was promised. And based on that, all types of collaborative and cooperatives are being made to start people start their own energy company because the data is accessible for everybody. So we see a whole bunch of uh, uh, business only coming from the whole idea to give people the data, their data, on the use of energy. And people now start to build their own energy companies together with their neighbors, with their best friends, people starting name with an A and everything. So it's a very classic example, but it's also most advanced. There are over 40 new energy companies started in our city within the last years, started by individuals or small companies because they have the data and they didn't have it before. Obviously, there are tremendous amount of examples around healthcare as well, around mobility. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, well, there are quite a few examples. Uh, 
anyone wants to add a, something I, I, on this? I, I mean, two things actually, good and bad. I mean, I think a good one, I mean, our transport um, agency, Transport for Greater Manchester, has, has used the open apps c competition to develop a number of kind of user-driven apps about how you can integrate transport and information about transport so you can get a around on public transport very easily. I'd actually, for once, talk quite negatively about some of the challenges, though, because in a country like the UK, where outside of London all transport is privatised and the private companies say, no, we will not put GPS systems in our buses uh, unless you give us millions of pounds to do so, is very frustrating. And when, as soon as we talk about intelligent bins, the newspapers will go and say, city wants to spy on citizens to, you know, find out what they're throwing away. And so, you know, there are a lot of perceptional challenges to things that technologically are very easy to do. And the interesting thing when you look at continental Europe, where the buses and trains are still run by the city, in many cases, the energy company is run by the city. It's so much easier when you can bring together users and institutions that at least have some semblance of democratic control and I think in the UK we have some fantastic ideas but implementing them can be a little bit more difficult in the public sphere I think probably in the business sphere probably eat more easily but that that's that's a good and the bad story from Manchester certainly okay. any any other questions from the audience oh wow three <laughs> hi Oops, sorry, that was a little bit loud. No, I just really wanted to ask, um, obviously we're talking about making the, the life of the citizens of, of the city better, and I just wondered really if any polling had been done to the citizens to see what they feel would make their life better and what's important to them, or if someone at the top just decides what they think will make their life better and implements it to try it. Yeah, uh, no. so the kind of <laughs> the we tried. Uh, what do you, uh, do you see is uh, very correct. Uh, we uh, we have a limit uh, till now. We um, we offered some services, uh, and we thought that our service, our technology, was the best. Uh, the qu it could uh, solve uh, a problem uh, and uh, improve the quality of life of the citizens. But it's not so. And then you hope that somebody hoping will use the service of this app. But uh, it does, does it happen? So we started uh, a new project. Uh, the name is Smart Campus, and we are developing and thinking the services uh, really needed from the students. It's a university with the students. They are really improving together with the university to so offer and demand together, and they are asking what they need. They are using and giving feedback about uh, the they self uh, they could uh, develop. So so it's uh, an example of uh, participation. Well, well, specific, specifically in Malaga, we have an entire department that's uh, de devoted to citizen participation. And so uh, this department, obviously we have kiosks set up around the city and the municipal buildings where people, it's like a suggestion box, but they can input the information. And then we also do surveys uh, to citizens anytime we have interaction or contacts with them. So um, we're also very concerned about uh, what they call the, the digital divide and or breach and trying to educate um, citizens because you know unfortunately many people have never seen perhaps an iPhone or, or an iPad or a smartphone or whatever and so uh, we have you know buses and, and we go around and visit the neighborhoods and show people and at the same time ask them you know what what services and things they want to see uh, from their city also another thing in Spain is that uh, the digital the media uh, whether it's newspaper or digital media people are very uh, very keen on you know sending their comments into the paper the newspaper or to the websites and I think you see that also with with Twitter and other social medias that um, they're not afraid to complain or, or make suggestions about what would make their lives lives better um, we've, we've actually taken that to the next step and, and implemented a program uh, that's an application for their phones that uh, where citizens can take photographs of you know if there's a broken street sign or a hole in the ground uh, and can s and email that to the city uh, and we'll take care of that and actually email it back to them once th with a photograph saying this has been resolved um, and so we we definitely listen to the citizens that's that's you know vital that's important that's what we're what we're there for I think the same goes for us I think there are four ways to interact with citizens one is well, the Living Lab methodology, which really interactive based on a certain theme, I mean, that really works to get information. Secondly, we have uh, organized user groups uh, on a district level or on a thematic level. And we also do 
well, regularly, once, twice a year, surveys amongst certain neighborhoods or areas and just ask open, blunt, what's your issue? And the fourth one, maybe is most important, it's called elections, which is every four years, and then teams will pop up anyhow. Okay, there was another question, yes. I think we can take just one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as cities, how do you benefit from hackathons? Do you think that you are benefiting? I mean, how? Or do you? <laughs> uh, yeah, um, w we, we've um, taken ideas both from Amsterdam and New York, so we're not claiming to be first uh, in any way. Um, and I think some decision makers, particularly at the political level, needed convincing that this wasn't just um, allowing data to go to hackers for its own sake, that it had a real purpose. And I think there were two things, really. One is a genuine commitment to do it, because there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of talking about user engagement, but unless you really do make, as we did for our first hackathon, 60 data sets that had never been open, completely open, and engage uh, with that process, then you know there's a reputational thing that needs to be established first. But secondly, I mean, out of the 16 teams that took part in that first one, and we've had about six smaller hackathons since, um, we could have had no useful apps at all. And I think probably 12 of the 16 ca came out with something that everyone who took part agreed could be used. And four of them, as I mentioned, are actually in development as real apps that will go on either responsive website or directly to, to, to phone apps. Those people now have a chance with some of the prize money, which was fairly small. So let's be honest, in these really difficult times, it's incredibly cheap to do a hackathon rather than go out to tender for contracts for apps that might never happen. So it's a testing the market, testing the skills of these people. And for us, I, I think everyone has thought it was a, a brilliant idea, but we didn't exactly invent it. So in some ways, we could take some of the lessons, good and bad, from New York and Amsterdam and kind of reconfigure them. But, uh, uh, you know, 90% positive rating. And I think the only 10% that came back negative was not enough prize money. I, I, think, I, I think we now, we're doing these hackathons and they're pretty good to put things on the agenda or to get data requests and all these things. And we're still doing them, which is good. Actually, uh, the, the organization that organizes most of them is called Hack the Government. So it means, I mean, it gives a bit of an idea of the, how, how, how we look into this. But we now uh, also have accelerator programs and incubator programs clicked onto that because a hackathon gives a bit of an idea but doesn't give you something that's well in, in, in the app store tomorrow and it's scalable you can't expect that as well from developers so like you have four selected and you really start to work with them i mean th this is what hackathons are good for to gather ideas to get put it on the agenda to uh, uh, but then you really need to help people to go to supply the proper data dynamically preferably in a proper API and all these things. And this is something the city should realize as well. It's not like we organize a hackathon and we have 150 of brilliant apps. It doesn't work that way. You really need to support developers a bit further, I think. So, uh, thank you. I think it has been a very great panel. Uh, so let me ask you for an applause to the panelists. <laughs>to achieve uh, the application of uh, fiber technologies in other domains, in particular generation of content. The FI Content Initiative to drive innovation at the crossroads of content, media, networks and creativity. FI Content aims at developing and experimenting cutting-edge ICT platforms across Europe, devoted to applications and services in the areas of social connected TV, smart city services and pervasive game platform. Any European stakeholders, particularly developers and SMEs willing to innovate and boost their business can access and use these open platforms.
Whilst doing so, they'll receive support from the FI content companies and research centers. Open Calls will offer funding to selected stakeholders to support their efforts. FI Content is part of the Future Internet Public-Private Partnership or FIPPP flagship program supported by the European Commission with total investment of 600 million euros over five years to build Europe's future internet. Join the FI Content community now. Okay, so let me uh, end up with uh, um, a couple of announcements and then for closing the last video about uh, how fiber is going is being used in in the e-health area, which is one of the also very rather promising areas where uh, we believe that the definition of standards and the creation of an open e and a innovation ecosystem can really uh, bring a differential value. And that announcement I wanted to make is that one of the hackathons that uh, we, we we plan to run, well, it's going to be more a kind of a challenge with uh, that will expand over uh, the the whole period until the end of the project. Fiber is is a special challenge on smart cities. So let me take advantage of uh, our presence in this uh, stage to announced the, uh, the launch of this talent challenge. Uh, there will be at least 150,000 euros in prices uh, for this challenge. We aim to find out the best uh, applications that uh, can really help to materialize this concept of uh, smart cities. So any entrepreneurs, developers that believe uh, uh, can have uh, great ideas on how those applications could uh, uh, could work. Uh, please uh, uh, stay tuned because we will publish information about this challenge uh, in uh, both the website, Fiber website, but also the Campus Eros platform. So it is. Um, I assume that all of you are already connected to the Campus Eros uh, platform. So that means that soon you will receive an email uh, describing this new challenge, which is uh, going to be exciting. We are going to run it uh, over several phases and classification phases, and also giving the opportunity to the different contestants to attend uh, other campus parties, uh, promote their applications uh, in those campus parties, and show it to cities that are going to be there also present. So this is going to be really great, a uh, lot of fun, but also a lot of uh, business opportunities uh, for entrepreneurs. Uh, don't f uh, forget uh, the hackathon that we have uh, uh, currently in place in the campus party. You know that we are giving two twenty thousand in 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 prices, uh, um, and there is one um, one um, a special price that has to do with the uh, connection with the Internet of Things, and that is clearly an area where you could put in place some ideas that could be exported to smart cities. We also made a liaison with one of the hackathons that is also running in parallel, which is the uh, Hacking for Something Better hackathon. So one of the prices they are running is uh, for smart cities applications in this campus party. So if you develop a nice application that could apply for smart cities using firewall technology, you will be able to get a lot of money out of it. Um, let me finish now with, with a video about uh, e-health and the application of uh, fiber technologies in e-health and with this uh, we uh, could close the, this, uh, this session. Thank you very much for your attendance. way we deliver healthcare, not only in the UK or in European countries, but globally has to change. The reason for that is simply the demographic development and the, the costs to society.
most of the patients here in Romania, uh, the cardiac ones, aren't uh, really used to using mobile phones or tablets. But I think the way this program is uh, made, it will make things much more easier. Star can give us a platform to uh, be able to give psychotherapy to all patients with bipolar disorder. We are here developing new technologies for surgery and gastrointestinal medicine to reduce surgical trauma. Si, si, certo. I hope that it will be a really nice uh, solution, proving that, uh, that several people, several companies having the same vision can create one common thing for, for everybody. Okay, so thank you for attending. Just last reminder about the next workshop of firework, which is going to happen at four o'clock, so in, in five minutes. And we'll deal with uh, 3D uh, web uh, technologies and how you could incorporate also augmented reality features, which is something, by the way, very related to smart cities applications. And uh, also media processing, generic enablers that uh, you could use nicely to, to create that application that will really be able to win the contest uh, this Friday. Thank you very much for attending and also again to the panelists for this person.